to first service, but the time change caught you off guard. Yeah, okay, there's some honest people. I like it. All right. Um, no, I'm excited to share this message with you. Um, uh, Jeff spoke on how to fight a good fight uh, a few weeks ago, so hopefully you all went home that night and fought it out real well, biblically. Uh, PT talked about the myths of marriage uh, last week. Um, I don't know if any of you guys, we, we are part of a life group, and that opened up a lot of great discussions on expectations and uh, how that looks in uh, not only just married life, but if you really boil some of these things down, how we relate to our marriage is often a reflection of how we deal with any relationship. Uh, your marital relationship really just puts a magnifying glass on how how dysfunctional you are, right? Um, um, and so uh, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5, not to be too cliche, but we're going to get right into this. Um, this morning, I get to talk to you about how we can be happy in our marriage, or how can we be happy in the marriage that we hope to someday have if you are single. Um, and I have a pretty straightforward message, um, and the three things I hope to ask and answer is, first and foremost, what is a true picture of marriage? Secondly, Why are we unhappy in our marriage? And finally, how can we be happy in a marriage we have or hope to have someday? So we're going to kind of try to tackle those three things. Before we do that, would you just pray with me? Uh, Father God, I thank you so much for for the grace on our lives, Lord. Father, I just pray this morning that you would do real heart work inside of every single one of us. That, Lord, that this message would not be looked at as as someone who's just telling everyone else to do, but, Lord, that we would understand we are all in community together and need one another in order to see our marriages and our families happy and healthy. Um, Father God, I pray that we would dispel a lot of the beliefs that maybe we've come up with, whether it's in the culture we grew up in or the families we grew up in, Lord, and we would really submit ourselves to your truth and your word this morning that you would open our eyes, you would speak to our spirits, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's start in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This is the Apostle Paul, if you, uh, uh, if you are familiar. It says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. I want you to notice a couple things with me as we begin to open this up. I don't know anywhere else in Scripture where someone puts such a picture, paints such a picture of what marriage actually is, right? Now, think of that with me in our modern day thinking. Here's what we don't see anywhere said, not only in here, but other epistles or other portions of scripture referring to marriage. We don't see that you will always agree on the things you would both like. We don't see that you will always feel the exact same way you do when you said I do that there will not be difficulty. Nowhere do we see Paul say that, that, that even consider the idea of how you should feel about everything. He doesn't talk about how this other person should fulfill you. He never talks about butterflies. He never talks about setting off into the sunset for relational bliss and that you have met your perfect match and this is your soulmate. That never occurs. But here's what we do see when talking about marriage in a biblical context. We see submission. We see this idea of crucifixion, of dying to yourself, of giving up yourself, of sanctification, of being cleansed or made pure, to be made without spot or wrinkle, being holy, treating someone as you would want to be treated or the golden rule. We see this idea of nourishing each other, cherishing each other, holding fast to this other person, becoming one. 
the utmost respect, leaving your old family to establish a new family. What is the prime idea of marriage? Like anything biblically, it's to make you more like Christ. And so we have this entire idea, and I want to read before the precursor that Paul gives us. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further... Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I didn't mention this in first service, but I'll mention it now. That verse 18, that don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life, that almost seems out of place. But there's something interesting about that idea that most scholars at this time believe when they would talk about getting drunk with wine, we think of it as escaping our problems. Back then, the primary thought of getting drunk was trying to escape yourself. As we begin to unpack this idea of what it means to be happy in our marriage, we have to understand something. We never see external factors being the condition for why you are or are not happy in your marriage. Paul, over and over and over again, points the finger at personal, individual responsibility. Marriage is not perfect. It can't be perfect. He never talks about being perfect. Why? Because there's not perfect people. And even if you found the perfect person, what would they want to do with you? You're not perfect. The issues that you might be coming into this place with, I remember one of the greatest lies me and my wife began to feel was that the things that we were encountering as a young, you know, less than a year married is that we are the only people encountering this lie or encountering this problem. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Paul never focuses on the externals, on our spouse's maturity being the key to marriage making us happy. The truth of the matter is, I benefit my marriage and the person I have made this commitment to by tending to the things that are growing and festering in my own heart. Church, we have to be careful that we don't allow this modern way of thinking about marriage to infiltrate our minds. Marriage is not picking the flowers that you want out of the garden that just naturally goes on its own. It is more picking weeds. It is more getting rid of the things that will naturally cause decay if you do not tend to them. Marriage, to give it a a proper definition this morning, marriage is the sacrificial commitment to the good of the other by the power of God within you. Did you know we actually don't ever see a secular view of marriage? Marriage, by definition, is religious. It was founded in a Judeo-Christian worldview. It is the commitment to a person under, under God. It is a covenant I make with someone. And so what would that say? That love biblically, love in a covenant context, is more action than it is emotion. Love is more what I am willing to do and sacrifice that will lead to emotion. Now, Western society has said that marriage is for the fulfillment of the individual. There is the equal danger of falling into opposite, what we would call a traditional society. That marriage is only a social transaction to make family the ultimate value. We have a phrase on our staff that you can't be in ministry if you're not a family man. And I, and I believe in that. I think that's a very important thing. I think that anything it is I accomplish in ministry for what I do for, for a paycheck and my calling in ministry should be an outflow and already operational under the four women that God has chosen to give me. 
If I do things well in here, but I don't do them well in my home, I should probably lose my job. Now, what we have to be careful of, though, is, is that we do not make family the ultimate good. That is not the indicator. That is, uh, family in and of itself can become an idol. What is the ultimate good? Christ. Christ is the ultimate good. Only the gospel can tie the feelings, the emotions of satisfaction and serving one another with the duty of sacrificing and denying yourself on behalf of your God and the people around you. When the Apostle Paul says, do these things, he doesn't say them so that you get what you want, so that you help the other person uh, uh, look a certain way or make yourself certain. Like, why does he say, do these things? Why does he say, submit? Why does he say, die to yourself? Why does he say, serve one another? Verse, verse 21, out of reverence for Christ. That is first and foremost what we are meant to be. The, so first and foremost, if you are unhappy in your marriage, the first place to look is in your personal contentment in Christ. It's the same as everything else in our life. The idea that our marriage will magically fix itself if I don't have something that is center, something that I worship more than appeasing my spouse, it's going to cause me to be sporadic and lose focus of what the truth is in my life. The entire premise of a spirit-led Christian marriage is built on the premise that you have been spirit been filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of unselfishness itself. Pastor Jeff talked about this in his first week, this idea that what do we do? We leave our mother and our father and we hold fast to this person. This, this word uh, roughly translates as cleaving. We hang on for, I don't know, for dear life. It's a covenant, it's a covenant. It's a public promise to share everything it is that I am with this other person. I don't mean to make fun or poke fun at anyone who might have this going on in this room. I don't know of any, so I'm going to plead ignorance with what I'm about to say. There has been this popular phrase that has come up amongst millennials specifically in this idea of getting married. That the phrase goes something like this. I don't need a piece of paper to show you that I love you. Yes, you do. That statement right there places love as something, as an emotion, as a feeling you hope will be given to you for the rest of your life. Biblically, that is not correct. Biblically, I, do, I cannot see your love by your emotions. I can see your love by what? Your commitments. What are you committed to, no matter what may come? Who are you committed to, no matter what things you might not know about them? Because the, here's the truth. Young people, I've been married about nine years, approaching 10, pretty much an expert on it. So uh, this goes without saying. <laughs> three kids in it, it's going good I'll let you in on a secret if you're thinking about getting married you're not marrying the real person you're marrying your idea of the person and marriage is the commitment to find out who that person is and help and intercede and contribute to their sanctification process by you sacrificing your wants and needs to the betterment of this commitment that you made. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 tells us, talking about Christ, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life would what? no longer live for themselves. Instead, first and foremost, they will live for Christ 
who died and was raised for them. This gives us the very essence of sin. It's living for us. It's using everything around us, our children, our marriage, our job. And as when we are left to our own devices, we use everything we can to see how we can benefit from it. But when we have given and surrendered our life to Christ, it gives us true freedom to no longer live with the paranoia of what we get out of every situation, but we can give generously in the same way that Christ Christ lived and gave himself up for us. Your marriage was meant to be the very depiction of what Christ accomplished for the church. Because the opposite is something we have to confront. The idea that left to our flesh, that we are this free people, is not true. If you can't say no to your pet peeves and your possessions and your control and your emotions, who's really free? Not you. Only through Christ, only through that surrender can we see and know what true freedom looks like. Matthew chapter 22 says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Here's the truth. The gospel's influence in my life is seen in how I treat the people closest to me and annoy me the most. I do life with you guys a fraction of the time. My wife has to tolerate me and my snarkiness darn near 24-7. The type of man I am, you know, I've told my, I've told my, my, my uh, leadership team in student ministry, The best things about me as a husband and a man and a leader are yet to be seen. And here's what I mean by that. I understand. I I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and I've been married nine, almost ten years. The real trajectory and character that I have as a man isn't seen in a day, but it's seen over a long period of time of doing my best at doing the right thing in the same direction. Does that make sense? We've made this grand mistake of equating leadership as gifting. Leadership is integrity. Leadership is sacrifice. Leadership is taking responsibility even when it may be someone else's fault. The honest truth is is that we've replaced this idea of taking responsibility and and allowing things to grow and mature in the way that God intended them to, and we've sacrificed it for this idea of being in love. Here's the truth. Being in love is just an ego kick. Being in love is just this idea that, hey, here's this person. They look really pretty. They're an 8.5 out of 10. Other people seem to think so, and they dig me. And so because they dig me, that gives me some sort of self-worth. But that's not real love. I want to read, I haven't done this in a while, but I couldn't resist this time. I want to read a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, people get from books the idea that if you have married the right person, you may expect to go on being in love forever. As a result, when they find they are not, they think this proves they have made a mistake and are entitled to a change. Not realizing that, when they have changed, the glamour will presently go out of the new love just as it went out of the old one. 
But let the thrills go, let it die away, go on through the period of death into the great but much more profound and interest of happiness that follow, and you will find that you're living in a world of new thrills all the time. But if you decide to make thrills your regular diet and you try to prolong them artificially, it will all get weaker and weaker, fewer and fewer, and you will be a bored, disillusioned old man for the rest of your life. If you're still hoping that your happiness will be fulfilled by some sort of emotional kickback by your spouse, I would argue maybe you haven't truly given yourself to the maturation process that God wants for you. What we have done is we've taken this idea of marriage being a covenant And we've turned it into a consumer relationship. We've said, this is a person who meets my needs at an acceptable cost. But if someone else or something else comes along that meets those same needs at a lower or more acceptable cost, I'm then going to begin to invest in that more than I do this because the cost is just not worth the benefit. And that's harsh, and I I hear what I'm saying. But there's another relationship that we can kind of glean from that can give us some perspective. How many of you have ever had a one-year-old around your house? Most selfish things on the planet. (laughs) They are. If you can't tell from my voice, I was feeling a little rough earlier this week, and uh, my wife and I, along with uh, Mariah and a few others, we lead a life group on Thursday nights, and I came home Thursday, and I told my wife, hey, I'm just going to get a quick nap in to rest up for group. So I go off, and I I never nap. And so I went, I laid down in bed, and I was out pretty quickly, and Lucy, our our youngest, she's just over one, and she started walking, and she doesn't stop walking. And we, my parents gave us these, uh, like, they're like dog steps, but we use them for our kids, uh, because they're all way too short to get up into our bed without them. And I'm laying there, totally dead to the world. And, and like, you know how like, you can kind of subconsciously hear things in your sleep? All of a sudden, I feel something get in the bed with me. And Ellie has six teeth, four on top, two on the bottom, all dead center. The first thing that she does, she doesn't stop and say, hey, I wonder if dad is tired and he's got work to do later, so maybe I should be sensitive to where he's at right now. The first thing he does, she does, she climbs on top of me and bites my nose as hard as she can with all six teeth. And apparently I didn't react fast enough. Because then she takes her hand and tries to pry open my, my, my right eye. And I like it took everything in me not to just violently react towards what she was doing. That summarizes the parental relationship to a one-year-old. At three, they get a little bit less selfish, maybe. At five, they get a little bit more reasonable. But you would never advocate that a parent abandon their one-year-old. Why? Because society has said that is a covenant relationship in which you made an agreement that no matter what may come, you tend to it. That you be the more mature person and you allow yourself to be poured out no matter the lack of reciprocation. Marriage is not a consumer relationship. It's a covenantal one. And church, we have to get back to that agreement that we didn't just make some idealistic pledge that I'm going to do this until it is no longer satisfying. But I made a commitment before my God and I made a commitment to this person. Really what we're getting at And really all of our problems derive from this main problem that Christ came to solve in the human heart and that is self-centeredness. We have to come to an understanding that all of us are constantly tempted with self-centeredness. 
Self-centeredness uh, uh, believes that it is everyone around me who is responsible for making me happy. Self-centeredness tells us that if everyone else would just get their act together and go with the program that I have put together, whether I've uh, uh, communicated it or not, then not only my life, but everyone else's life would go so much better. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 kind of helps us hone in on this. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrong. Once again, it removes this idea of what our feelings and our emotions tell us. And this is your second point. Feelings, while great, they don't reveal truth as much as they reveal our true motive. I said this first service, I'll say it again, is that can be a good thing too. I remember when me and my wife, I think it was our first year of marriage, and we were kind of having just this disconnect and trying to get to the bottom of something. And at one point, my wife just kind of said, you know, my feelings are, I know this isn't true, but that we're disconnected. Feelings, they are a great indicator. They'll help you get in the door, but it's understanding what is true that will keep you inside. The Apostle Paul, he lays all these things out. He talks about love being patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful. That word boastful is interesting. You want to know a really literal translation of that? It's don't be a windbag. That's literally what that means. It means an inordinate desire to draw attention to one's self. Is your marriage the vehicle to point to the glory of Christ or draw everything back to the needs and desires that you have and want? There was this study that came out recently. It's a secular study. They did a survey of uh, recently divorced couples and they asked them, hey, what, what was present in your marriage when you started to notice that you were unhappy and began to take the idea of divorce becoming more seriously. And they listed things, and I'm not making this up. I began to get impatient. There was a lot of unkindness. I began to get jealous of my spouse's other relationships, whether working or familial. Uh, I, things began, I began, they, I watched them get more arrogant in myself. There was a rude tone to our home. There was this constant competition for us to demand our own way. I noticed myself frequently irritable and it became a scoreboard in our house of who got what right and who got what wrong. The Apostle Paul is essentially saying, if you want to be unhappy and miserable, specifically in your marriage, do everything the opposite of what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 4 through 5 say. But if you want to be happy, learn how to be patient. Learn how to be kind. Those things are written there not because they are our natural inclination, but because we need to practice those things. Again, specifically with the people who annoy us the most. And self-centeredness has this tricky way of not only being blind to your own issues that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but then it also makes you hypersensitive and offended by the lack thereof in everyone else, doesn't it? Uh, Matthew chapter 16, I want to turn there. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever would lose his life for my sake will find it. Real quick, you want to know another, and this is just because I'm a nerd and I like to look up these things. You want to know another interesting indicator of divorce couples? Lack of community, specifically lack of community that love both, both parties equally. So what does that eliminate? We're not talking about your family. We're not talking about the place where you grafted this person in. 
We're talking about a community that will tell the both of you the truth in love, and you'll stick around long enough to hear it and accept it. Okay, back to Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. What is Jesus saying? Forever loses, save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He's essentially trying to move us off the whole idea of happiness to purpose. That if the entire crux of your life, if your entire aim is just simply to be as happy and as uh, 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 not inconvenienced as possible, you won't have either. If you replace Christ for the pursuit of happiness, you won't have either. But if you seek him more than you seek happiness, you will have both. You have to understand that happiness and true contentment is on the far side of sacrifice and giving of yourself, not in the immediate side. You have to see your marriage is not a stage for you to be the center. It's the covenant you agreed to be a servant Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, we read this earlier. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That word submit is actually a military term. It's a Greek military term. Why would Paul say that? Any of you that have served, you know that when you join the military, you don't get to pick where you sleep. You don't get to pick when and what you get to eat all the time. You don't get to lead and make every decision based on your preferences. You don't get to make every decision that solely benefits you. He uses that term because anyone who has been a part of something greater knows you have to forsake the individual to have greater unity to be a part of the whole. I, as a husband and a father, could insist on my own way in everything. But where would that leave me? Alone. Isolated, it would create bitterness and resentment from all those around me. To have greater unity, to be a part of the whole, you have to surrender your independence. One of the greatest obstacles to our own happiness is the obsession with our individuality and the desire to control others. That's not for you to worry about. So, this is where bitterness and resentment begin to settle in. When our feelings go away, when the butterflies wear off, when the honeymoon goes away, when all these unforeseen problems come. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says a couple of interesting things I want to look at. It says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Interesting there. Like the Apostle Paul, the writer says that if you want to see peace in your world and in your life and in your home, what is your responsibility? Your own individual holiness. Not your spouse's problems. Not where they're not getting it right. It is what you can control and how you can steward what God has pointed out in your life and in your world. He continues, so see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. I, uh, we bought a house, we're coming up on two years now. And it was last spring, um, the couple before us who owned the house, they were quite a bit older and uh, they, they were just unable to maintain some of the property. And uh, I, uh, I, I love uh, taking care of my lawn. Uh, I don't know if that's because I'm half Hispanic, but it's just something I take great pride in. And uh, I plan on handing that over to my children. Um, but anyway, so I, I was cutting the grass one time and uh, I noticed all of these weeds in these particular areas where things were neglected. And I'm pulling them. 
And they're just these little guys that you just kind of can pluck out. And I throw them in the driveway to let them get scorched up. And Frankie, my oldest, my, my, my five-year-old, she's like, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm pulling these weeds. Because if, you, if, if you're not careful, those will outgrow the grass. And then it'll kind of overshadow the grass. And then you're just left with a yard full of weeds. So, she's, so she loved that idea. So she's going around trying to pluck every weed that she possibly can. There's even times where I see her play in the yard and she'd stop. And then she'd pull that weed, let me know that she was proud, and then move on with the rest of her day. And I remember this one time, though, we're going, and this, a couple weeks later, uh, uh, there, was this, there was this big old sucker that was uh, on the side of the house where we don't really go. This thing had grown. It was like a small tree at this point. And uh, Frankie was kind of avoiding it. And uh, I brought Frankie over. I'm like, hey, let's, let's kind of look at this one over here. She goes, yeah, Dad, I saw that. I don't, I don't think that's a weed. I think that's just a, I think it's just a flower. I'm like, that's weird. So I'm kind of like, no, 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 let's pull. And she, so she wants to go over, and she, she goes to pull, and she just can't get it out. And if you notice, if you notice anything about, especially firstborns, and my daughter specifically, is that when she can't handle something on her own, she avoids it. She tends to justify it. She tends to say, well, this must not be the problem that I actually had. It must be something different. It's easy to look at the little things that we can quickly pluck out of our life. But how many of you know when you got married, you probably brought in some deeply rooted habits and ideas and ways of communicating and some dysfunction into your marriage that you probably don't have the power on your own to pluck out yourself. That's why we have to come to the Holy Spirit and ask him to remind us, to show us where we've been deceived, to pluck out these roots of bitterness and resentment as the writer of Hebrews says. We need his power. If you find yourself unhappy in your marriage this morning, I would ask you how much do you actually depend on the Holy Spirit to help you and guide you to be the husband, the father, the the wife, the mother that you need to be in your family. This idea to defile means to poison many, to spoil everyone's life. That root of bitterness, that term, it's a bitter weed that causes trouble and annoyance because it spreads and sucks the life out of the things we actually want. What's interesting about that idea is we tend to look at that as, well, when I act a certain way, I need to watch out. Jesus never actually gives us that. In Luke chapter 17, how does he start this whole thing out? So watch yourselves. Watch yourselves. If another believer sins, you rebuke that person. And then if there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. He starts the entire thing not with watch them, But watch yourself. Jesus was fully aware of the human condition that when we are wrong, our immediate reaction is to look at them. But Jesus says, you need to be aware of your heart. You need to be aware that you are more pushed around by the actions of others than you would ever care to admit. Paul echoes this idea in Ephesians chapter 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That word wrath is really interesting. It means passion, heat, like an inflaming wine which either drives the drinker mad or kills him with its strength. That word, I did some digging. Uh, It has the same root word. Most of you probably won't recognize this word. It's the word wraith, W-R-A-I-T-H. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, These, man, these writers who used to write some of these old things, like the Lord of the Rings, they are brilliant. They have such spiritual implications. But this word wraith, Modernly translated is the word ghost. 
That's what that word roughly translates as. Now, when you look at the original idea of what a ghost, the old word, the word for ghost, in a very traditional sense, it is a spirit that can't rest. It's a spirit that stays in the same place where something was done to them, something wrong, and they can't get over it or stop reliving it. So when Paul tells us to deal with our wrath, what's he saying? Make sure that your spirit doesn't stay put in the same place where something was done wrong to you and you drag everyone else back to that place. If you don't deal with your wrath, it will turn you into someone who's controlled by the past and doesn't allow anyone else to move forward. That's what bitterness and resentment does to us. It takes gratitude, the gratitude for the blessings in our life. It becomes replaced by grumbling over the burdens of this person until, it, it, until bitterness saps a person's last remaining happiness. Bitterness, it isolates you. It makes you discontent, and it makes you and everyone miserable. James chapter 1 verse 20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. Do you notice repeatedly this idea of uprooting what happened and replacing it with something intentional? Your marriage doesn't make itself great on its own. It takes great intentionality and consistent attention every day of your life. We are all prone to give ourselves to this. In Genesis chapter 2, when Adam sees Eve, he says, at last, the man exclaimed, this one is, born, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She would be called woman because she was taken from man. There was this repeated idea and this understanding that when you marry somebody, we, that you get rid of the childish idea of sides that you get rid of the childish idea of whose fault it is and you take responsibility for who you are and how you conduct yourself. Many of the breakdowns we face in marriages are because we focus on who to blame rather than what we can personally improve. Paul echoes this idea. Specifically, men, I'm going to point at you. That my job, first and foremost, life is Christ's. But secondly, is to treat my wife, is to nourish her, be there for her, sacrifice for her in the same manner I would want done for myself. If I don't have that, I'm just playing marriage. I'm not really doing it. And we have to get rid of this idea that Christ solves marriages outside of ourselves. Christ didn't come to, to change institutions. He came to change the human heart. If you find yourself here this morning and your marriage is in trouble, please stop looking at the externals. And begin the rough, sometimes really difficult heart work of being introspective and asking the Lord of what he needs to uproot in the corners and crevices of your heart that you might have allowed to be neglected. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask some of our elders and pastors if they would make their way up here and You know, messages like these, they're not fun. 
Because if, if I'm honest with you, I, it, it convicted me in so many areas of my own life and my own marriage. And I just want to kind of close this morning with prayer. And I want to ask you that if, if you're sitting here and maybe you're disillusioned or dissatisfied in your own marriage, I would just encourage you either now with the Lord to begin to ask him not what your spouse or everyone around, or else around you got wrong, but what can you take ownership of? How can you replace the idea of happiness being everyone else's responsibility and it being something that you own for yourself? And if you feel you have that need for more, please make your way up here. These men would love to pray with you. They would love to pray with you and, 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 and minister with you and ask the Lord and, and intercede with you. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for every heart, soul, and mind that, Father God, we would treat our marriages not as these consumeristic ideas, but that, Lord, we would replace them, we would replace those ideas with that it is a covenant, that we made a commitment before you, Lord. We spend so much of our time wondering what it's gonna be like standing in front of a pastor as we make vows. And sometimes we neglect that one day we're going to stand before a throne and the Lord may ask us, what did you do with the things that I called you to steward? One of those things is our spouse. It's our husband and our wife. And so Father God, I pray that we would begin to ask those sorts of questions as a church. That, Father God, we would come before you and we'd be willing to sacrifice and surrender maybe our preconceived notions of what we think will make us happy and we would trade it for the life of surrender that you called us to, Jesus. That as we follow in your footsteps, we would no longer live for ourselves, but we would live unto you first and foremost and be an example to our spouse and to our children and to our community. In Jesus' name, all God's people said... Amen. I love you, Calvary Church. Hope to see you this Wednesday at Family Nights. If not, we will see you next Sunday. PT is wrapping up our basic training, basic training for marriage series. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your day.